For those of you, many of you have been following along on social media. We've been having some fun, inviting your participation. We're doing a series starting today called The Gospel According To. And so, you know, the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. But how many of you know that the gospel is told over and over and over again lots and lots of ways? So those are the original gospel. We've been inviting people to give us input. So we did some polls on social media. We're going to do some more this week and the following week where you get to help us decide. So this week between the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lord of the Rings and um, Chronicles Narnia won out. So what we're doing, say, what is this series? What do you mean the gospel according to? Mingo mentioned it. Um, This isn't really a new idea. There was a a theologian in the 20th century named Karl Barth who said, we should read in the morning with a Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And I want to talk about what that means as we start this series. What does it mean? It doesn't, it means simply this, that we recognize that the eternal, unchanging Word of God and story of Jesus is always speaking a living word to every generation and every age. So let me say it to you like this. The information in the newspaper is so temporary, they have to print one every day. That's the news. I mean, that's actually old. They have to put out a new breaking news alert every 20 minutes now, right? Because that news is so temporary, it comes out all the time. But the news about Jesus Christ is so eternal, it only needs to be told one time. And here's the news. King Jesus is risen from the dead. That's the most important news they'll ever be. And it will never change. But you know what is changing? My life is changing. My fears are changing. My hopes are changing. My times are changing. My culture's changing. But the gospel is the eternal news that Jesus is risen. We, in the month of July, have been talking about nudge. How do we notice the nudges of God? Pastor Dwayne, Pastor Chris shared with us for several weeks about noticing the nudge. We're going to take that a step further with this series and say, how do we notice the nudge in the midst of our culture, in the midst of songs or art or movie? And you say, man, that sounds like a crazy idea. Well, let me tell you who got this started. A guy named the Apostle Paul got us started on this journey. He was in Acts chapter 17. He was in a place called Mars Hill. And he's having a conversation with some people and he's trying to start telling them about Jesus. And they don't have any idea what he's talking about. So you know what he does? He reaches into their culture and he quotes two poets that they knew. I mean like songs you would know by heart. And he pulls them out and he says, you know, your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. And what the Apostle Paul does, he says, That didn't come from the Old Testament. That didn't come from the Bible. That came from one of your poets, one of your songwriters. But he said, I see a nudge from God in that. Because when you said in him, we live and move and have our, I know who him is. Him is Jesus. And Jesus is risen from the dead. So you see what Paul's doing. He's saying, guys, then he quotes another poet and he says, another one of your poets said, we are his offspring. We are his children. And Paul says, guys, let me tell you how that works. We become the children of God by putting our faith in Jesus who is risen from the dead. So the gospel according to is simply our Holy Spirit-led effort to listen to the changing times, what's going on in the world, in in all these different spaces, and notice some nudges, because every story, if we let it, and I'll show you what I mean by this, it will eventually lead to Jesus is risen from the dead, and that's why this matters. So let me me say it to you like this, make it as simple as I can. The gospel 
is the good news that King Jesus is risen from the dead. The gospel is the good news that King Jesus is risen from the dead. This news speaks to every human hope and every human fear. So I said it, I'm gonna say it one more time just to make sure we're clear, that never changes. Jesus is risen from the dead. So people get nervous, people get worried about what's happening in the world, wars, rumors of wars, political elections. You know what? That none of that can ever do is put Jesus back in the tomb. That, that is an irrefutable historical reality. Jesus, you say, well, what if this happens? And I say, you know what? Jesus ain't going back in the tomb. So Jesus is risen from the dead. You say, I lost my job. Jesus is risen. My marriage is on the rocks. Jesus is risen. I'm at the lowest point of my life. Jesus is risen. That's the good news. And that good news speaks to every single area of our life. So it speaks to hopes and fears. So Paul is in Acts 17 and he's dealing with hopes and fears of first century Athens, Greece. Hopes and fears. Do you know what's changed? The hopes and fears have changed. People are hoping for different things and they're afraid of different things now than they were then and every other generation and century. So if you drop down into 1942, everyone is hopeful that Nazi Germany will be defeated and they're fearful that Hitler's gonna take over the world. But we don't have that hope and fear anymore. We got different hopes and fears. So I wanna show it to you like this. Get it as clear as you can. It might change year to year, decade to decade, month to month. How many of you know your hopes and fears could change on a week, on a dime? Hopes and fears are constantly changing. King Jesus is risen is never changing. But King Jesus is risen speaks to every hope and fear. There's not a hope, there's not a fear. And you know what, culture, when we listen to music, when we listen to what's going on, what I want you to train your ear to do is when you listen to pop culture, when you listen to hip hop, when you listen to country, when you listen to whoever you listen to, whatever your flavor of the month is, listen for hopes and fears. And then you'll begin to see, oh, King Jesus is risen speaks to that. So this week we're looking at the Chronicles of Narnia, because you helped us decide. So uh, I would have preached on Lord of the Rings if more people would have voted for that. We're a democratic uh, society for this short period of time on social media. And so if you want to chime in, you got to follow us on Instagram or wherever you can and and vote. If you don't like this, I'm going to do my best. I think it's a good message. So if you were hoping for Lord of the Rings, just get over your defeat right now and get ready to receive. We're going to hear Chronicles of Narnia is written by C.S. Lewis, seven books, complete fiction, really children's stories. But C.S. Lewis is a Christian author and thinker, and he's weaving the gospel. So if you're not familiar with that at all, there's a, a lion in the Chronicles of Narnia. His name is Aslan, and he is the, the Christ-like figure. There are four children. Uh, let me see if I can remember them all. There's Peter, and there's uh, Edmund, and there's Lucy, and there's Susan. And they, they find themselves drawn into this magical world of Narnia, where Aslan, the, the great lion, is king of Narnia. And they develop a relationship, and he, it, you know, I'm not going to preach out of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. That's the most famous one. You, probably, you may have seen the movie but Aslan is killed, and then he's ri- risen from the dead. He, he dethrones the white witch, and winter goes away, and summer is there because King Aslan is reigning over Narnia. All right, but that's not our message this morning. Our message this morning is out of a conversation that Lucy has with Aslan. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. In the book, Prince Caspian, she has this conversation with Aslan, and she says she hasn't seen him for a long time. And she finally finds him. She's been looking for him. She finally finds him. And she says this. She says, Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. In other words, you're bigger than the last time I saw you. And Aslan replies to her. And he says, that is because you are older 
little one, answered he. And she says back to him, not because you are, in other words, not because you're not actually bigger. And he says back to her, I'm not, I'm not bigger. And then he says to her, every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Y- y- y'all didn't get that. I-, I gotta say that one more time. He said, I haven't got any bigger, but you have grown bigger. And because you grew bigger, I seem bigger to you than I did before. It's not me that's grown. I don't change. But the more you grow, the bigger you'll think I am. I'm gonna preach up in here right now out of the Chronicles of Narnia. So just so everybody is clear, we're gonna go to the Bible now, okay, so everybody's happy. We're gonna go to the Bible, make sure C.S. Lewis knows what he's talking about. Look with me real quickly in uh, 1 John chapter three. We'll put this on the screen for you. 1 John chapter three, he says, beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, let me help you. Maybe we can leave that on the screen, however it is. But let me help you read this. In a, in a better way than, than oftentimes we read it. So when we read, when we read, um, we shall know him when he is revealed, we shall see him. Let me help you. Don't think of when he is revealed as when he returns, okay? That's an okay way to read it. Nothing wrong with that. But if you only read it that way, you'll miss something. And C.S. Lewis is trying to get us to see that Lucy has a fresh encounter with Aslan. He reveals himself to him to her in a moment of her life. And when he reveals himself to her, she realizes, you're bigger than I remember. I didn't know you were as big. And so when we read these verses and we say, oh yeah, when Jesus comes back, we'll see him as he is and we'll be changed. We're missing something very important because Jesus is going to come back and reveal himself ultimately one day. But I want you to know that's what nudge means is that he's constantly showing up in your life. He's constantly appearing in your life. And the more we notice him, the more we see him as he is, and the more we go, oh my goodness, he's even more beautiful. He's more powerful. He's more than I ever thought he was. Lucy and the children of Narnia teach us something very important. Here's a question I have for you. Is my perception of Christ greater today than it was three years ago, five years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, six months ago? Is my perception of Christ? Lucy and the children of Narnia are fascinated with Jesus. So the title of my message this morning, I'm going to give you the title in the middle. The title of my message is, recovering our fascination with Jesus. We've got to recover. So let me say it to you like this. Let me say it to you in a really challenging way. One of the fundamental problems with the state of the American church is that we have lost our fascination with Jesus. One of the fundamental problems of the American church is that we have lost our fascination with Jesus. Just let that sink in. You say, well, what's, what's wrong? Well, maybe if we're honest, if we really get gut level honest, we're fascinated with a lot of things, but we're not fascinated with Jesus anymore. Or we could say it this way, we're less fascinated with Jesus than we used to be. You can remember a time in your life where you were fascinated with Jesus, but here's what I wanna tell you, is that Jesus is endlessly fascinating. 
And if you're living a Christian life in which you think you have discovered or had your revelation of who Jesus is, then Lucy and the children of Narnia have a message for you that the longer you go through life, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, the lion Aslan will surprise you. He will show up in your life in ways and places you didn't expect him to, and you can recover your fascination with who he is. Narnia teaches us that childlike fascination and wonder are essential to a growing life in Christ. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you this right now. One of the things, takeaways you can take out of this prayer is you can simply start to pray simple prayers like, Lord, help me recover my fascination with who you are. Lord, reveal yourself to me in a fresh and a new way and let me recover the sense of wonder that I have. Because if I don't do that, then I'm gonna keep Jesus in the box of revelation that I had him in when he revealed himself to me so many months or years or however long ago and not realizing that my glimpse of Jesus was limited and he wants to show me more of who he is. I wanna suggest to you that Lucy's conversation with Aslan shows us a pattern we should expect in our own lives and it's a pattern that Paul lays out in scripture. So I'm about to give you a bunch of New Testament right now, just in case somebody was going to try to say or email that Pastor Jay has gone to preaching out of movies. I'm going to dump a bunch of scripture on you right now, okay, just to to make you feel better. But let's read this together in Colossians chapter 3, and then I'm going to illustrate it to you this morning. But Paul says this in Colossians chapter 3. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above where Christ is. In other words, stay fascinated with the Jesus who raised you from the dead. Keep on seeking after Jesus. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Here it goes. He's going to start sounding like John now. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now, let me stop you right there and and keep you from doing the same thing. Don't read that verse and say, oh, when Jesus comes back, I'll appear with him in glory. Nothing wrong with that. But what it also means is that every time Christ appears in my life and I behold him, there's an opportunity for me to go from what the New Testament calls from glory to glory. That means I may have experienced some dimension of the glory of Jesus in my life, but every time I see him afresh and anew, I get to move into a new dimension of glory. I go from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, when we behold him, we're transformed into the same image and we move from glory to glory. So what I want you to do is just tell your neighbor right there so they don't fall asleep right there. Tell them, say, get ready for Jesus to appear. You need to get ready, right? And I don't, you know, understand what I mean, and I don't mean right there. So when Christ who is our life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, and desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he goes on, we're gonna jump to verse number 10, and he says, and have Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, watch this, according to the image of him who created him. Now, you gotta catch verse number 10. He said, you put on the new man that is created in the image of him who created him. So, uh, renewed in knowledge. That means I Stay fascinated with Jesus. Jesus reveals himself to me in a new way. And then that causes me to realize 
if that's what he's like, and I didn't realize that, then that means he's calling me to become more like that. Did you get that? Did you get that? So every time he reveals himself to me in a new way, I get an invitation to become like him in a new way. Now watch this, Colossians chapter three and verse number 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. For if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also forgive. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. All right. I know this is a lot, so I did you a favor, and I drew you another magnificent drawing. And I want to share that with you as we conclude our service. This is how we're going to work on recovering our fascination with Jesus. So if you want to look at the wall, I've got some scriptures, and I want you to realize something about this process. A lot of times in in, uh, church and in teaching, We think in terms of our our journey as a linear path that we just keep moving on. We just keep further and further and further. But I want to suggest to you that the New Testament is presenting something that's more like a cycle. It's like an ascending spiral staircase that we constantly wash, rinse, and repeat, but it's new every time. And this is what it looks like. It starts with beholding. It starts with me saying, you know, what does behold mean? Behold means pay attention. When the Bible says behold, it just means, what it means is look. Pay attention. It's noticing the nudge. It's, It's saying, hold on. It's Moses at the burning bush. He turned aside to pay attention. Something is going on here, and I'm gonna pay attention. And when I behold, I set my mind on things above where Christ is. When I do that, Christ reveals himself to me. And I go, that's Lucy going, oh my goodness, he's, he's bigger, you're bigger. No, I'm not bigger. You're seeing something about me you've never seen. What that does is it causes me to reflect on myself and I experience growth and transformation. So then I notice some things in me that don't look like him. And I say, these things don't look like him, so I'm going to put them to death. I'm going to put things like selfishness and covetousness and ambition and greed and anger and whatever. You fill in the blank. Why? Because these things were hindering my view of him, and I want to see him more. So you could take a picture of this. You could write all these scriptures down. I, this cycle is helping me. I think it'll help you. But watch what happens. We're transformed as we're transformed. Here's Lucy realizing he's even bigger. Wait a minute. Let me make this real plain to you. You ready? We're going to get, this is going to get the rubber. It's going to meet the road right here. Paul says in Colossians, what that looks like is I start to put on tender mercies. I start to put on kindness. I start to put on humility. I start forgiving more. I start bearing one another more. Are you with me? Why? Because I realized he's more merciful than I thought. Woo! I realized he's more forgiving than I realized. He's more kind than I thought he was. And because he's more kind... I'm going to become more kind. I'm going to invite him to help me become, wait a minute, he's more humble than I thought he was. So I'm going to grow in humility. I'm going to put on the new man that's renewed in the image of the one who keeps revealing himself to me. And then guess what you get to do? You just get to go back up to the top and you get to behold one more time. And you get to say, Lord, I can't believe you're. And so Paul gets to places in Romans chapter 11. He says, the wisdom and the mercy of God is unfathomable. I mean, this is Paul. He's been thinking about this for a while. He's been studying the scripture. And he says, 
the wisdom and the depth, it surpasses knowledge. So I can't just know it. Now let me tell you what I'm worried about. Because this is going to be real practical. We're going to go back to the screen in a minute. It's going to be real practical. What tells me, according to Paul, that I'm moving in the right direction. You ready for this, Pastor Aaron? What tells me I'm moving in the right direction is these things. If I'm growing in tender mercy, if I'm growing in kindness, if I'm growing in humility, if I'm becoming more forgiveness, I'm moving in the right direction. I'm not thinking of any of you, but I'm just going to tell y'all, I have noticed a few Christ followers, mostly on social media. They look less tender, less merciful, less kind, less humble, less, I'm going to keep on preaching, less forgiving, less bearing with one another in love. They look less that way. And what that tells me is that they have stopped somewhere. They have got Jesus and they put him in a box and they said, I got him figured out. And that empowers me to be mean, arrogant, hateful, judgmental, condemning. And when I see that, I go, oh man. You still think Aslan is as big as he was 10 years ago. You don't realize he wants to show you something about himself. And you have stopped the process of transformation in your life because you're losing your fascination with him because you think you've got him figured out. But if you would ask him to, he will help you recover your fascination with Jesus. Can I tell you something real simple? Jesus is better than you think he is. He's bigger than you think he is. He's more kind. He's more forgiving. He's more perfect. He's more beautiful than you've imagined. And today, if you'll say, Lord, regenerate my fascination with you. Give me fresh eyes to behold you with wonder and fascination again. I want to have a Lucy moment where I say, Lord Jesus, you're bigger. And you respond to me and say, no, I'm not bigger, but you're growing. But you, you're learning. You're becoming more like me. And then your heart's breaking instead of mumbling about the homeless guy begging on the sidewalk when you see him you feel Jesus's heart for him because you know all your opinions are less important than the love of Christ that's dwelling on the inside of you